Last Sunday, we began looking at the 62nd Psalm. And I titled, Trust in God at All Times. David is the author of the psalm, addressing it to Jeduthium. And while we do not know when it is written, uh, it is certainly a psalm that's suited for all time. David divides the psalm for us into three parts. In the first four verses, we see that we are waiting on God. When he writes, Truly my soul waiteth upon God. From him cometh my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be greatly moved. How long will ye imagine mischief against me, or against a man? <clears throat> ye shall be slain, all of you. <coughs> as a bowing wall shall he be, or shall ye be, and as a tottering fence. The only, they only consult to cast him down from his excellency. They delight in lies. They bless with their mouth, but they curse inwardly. He gives a view of God for us, that salvation only comes from God, and He is truly our salvation. He shows that God is likewise our protector, using the familiar to Him figures of a rock and a defense or high place that he often went to those areas where uh, he would be found or where he would have protection. And so we have truly our protection in him, but also he is our glory. Uh, He is certainly deserving of such, and we need to, in reverence, show that glory to him. He shows that personal relationship with, that he has with God and that he trusts in him. And then that his help or our help is in God. Then in verses 5 through verse 8, we have expectation in God alone. He says, my soul wait." Uh, My soul, wait thou only upon God, for my expectation is from Him. He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. (coughs) And God is my salvation and my glory. The rock of my strength and my refuge is in God. Trust in Him at all times, ye people. Pour out your heart before Him. God is, our refu- is a refuge and our help, or refuge for us. <clears throat> Expectation that God will save is what we see here. That we are to thus trust in Him at all times and literally pour out ourselves to Him. Certainly the need for prayer is seen in that. But it is pouring out our whole being to God. Our needs, our wants, our desires, our burdens, our cares. The problems that we have within this world. And then rely upon God to take care of those things for us. And we simply give ourselves totally to Him. We trust in Him and we submit to His will. Verses 9 through verse 12 then present to us the folly of trusting in man. He says, Surely men of low degree are vanity, and men of high degree are a lie. To be laid in the balance, they are altogether lighter than vanity. Trust not in oppression, and become not vain in robbery. If riches increase and set not your heart upon them, or set not your heart upon them, 
God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. Also unto thee, O Lord, belongeth mercy, for thou renderest to every man according to his work. <clears throat> Do not trust in man. What a simple way and statement because man cannot and does not have the means to help. He can do what he can, but there's really no help from man. And he mentions the men of high degree, the rich, the powerful man. They're not going to be able to help. And yet, so many times, that's where we place our trust in. That's what we seek within our society. That's what we go after, is so we can be that powerful individual, that wealthy individual. We'll have everything that we have need of, but in reality, those things will not satisfy and will not help. They might give hope of help, but in reality, none will be forthcoming. Our society today presents the idea that if you have these things, or if you have this money, that you, don't, you won't have any need of anything. You'll have everything that you have need of, and you'll make smooth sailing through your life that way. But the psalmist is saying that's not the case. You can place your trust in them, but they're going to fail. They will not sustain you during those times of trouble. Think of all of those rich people through the years. And, for example, war comes, wipes out all of their savings, all of their money. They've lost everything. Or even within our life, a fire comes to someone's house and destroys the house and all of their wealth, all that they have. And they are left devastated. Why? because they place their trust in those things instead of in God. In James, the second chapter, in verses 6 and verse 7, he says, But ye have despised the poor. And they ask the question, Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seats? Do not they blaspheme that worthy name by which you are called? Now, the calling that we have, of course, is the calling as Christians, called by the gospel of Jesus Christ out of darkness into the marvelous light of Christ. But here, James is asking them. They were showing deference. They were showing something to the rich man and tell him, oh, come in, sit here in the most high place, sit here in the good place. And then to the poor person, they'll say, you know, you get over there in the corner and you leave us alone. Is in effect what they were saying to them. And so they were showing preference to that rich man. And he's asking them why. They're the ones who have despised the poor. They've despised you. They've oppressed you. And you're now going to show them deference. You're going to show them priority with. They can't help. They might offer the promise of help, but a lot of times even the promises that they make never come to fruition. So don't place your trust there. And he speaks a great deal about money. You know, the Bible speaks a great deal about money. Uh, it has a lot to say about the subject. A lot of it has to deal with don't place your trust there. And the person who places their trust in money not going to achieve heaven's hope. 
but here he's talking about whether it be ill-gotten gain or money in general. Doesn't make any difference. It's not going to be able to help. In Matthew, the sixth chapter, verses 19 through verse 21, Jesus states, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Our tendency is to lay up treasures upon this earth. That we work and we save and we work and we save for this world. And someone asked, well, you know, I have to have money to give to my descendants, my children. I have to take, make sure that they're taken care of, and I have to make sure this person. And we're so worried about the things of this world. And Jesus is saying, you can't do that. Don't lay up for yourselves treasures upon this earth. Lay up treasures in heaven. That's where true riches are going to be found. That's where true help will be found. And so place your trust in God, not on the things of this world. Look at the foolish rich man that Jesus gives a parable of in Luke, the 12th chapter. That here he is, he's gone out, his crops produce greatly. He got all of it together and he said, well, my barns can't, fill, can't hold it all. I'm going to build bigger barns. And then I'll have everything that I need. And Jesus describes him in verses 19 and 20 of Luke 12. And I will say to my soul, So thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. From a man's standpoint, we would look at that individual and we would think, that is a successful individual. Look at him. He has been so successful, he's had to build bigger barns because he couldn't care, keep all of his goods. He's rich. He has everything that he has need of. And that's what he presented to himself. I'm going to take my ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But look at God's view of him. God said it to him, Thou fool! This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall all these things be which thou hast provided? You provided all of these things, all of these goods. When you're dead, who's, what difference is it going to make? Who's it going to belong to? In all probability, your descendants, your children are going to fight over it. Going to argue, this is mine, this is mine. And guess what? You're going to take absolutely nothing of it in front to, with you to eternity. It's all going to be gone. Thus, God describes that individual that man would say he's prosperous, he is a successful man, and God says he's a fool. Because he made plans for this world, but he did not make plans for the coming world. And so, place your trust in God. And that's what we see there in verse 11. The twice. God has spoken once, twice have I heard this, that power belongeth unto God. God speaks once and we are to hear it. With both our ears and our hearts, as some have described this. We must have respect for the Word of God. And as we were talking about in Bible class this morning, we have to have confidence that God will be what He says He's going to be, do what He says He's going to do. 
that his, he cannot lie. He cannot be contrary to himself. But that he will do what he says he's going to do. If we can't have confidence in that, then we can't have any confidence of salvation. If we cannot be confident and know that God cannot lie when he says that he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, then what can we believe? What should we practice? Why should we practice it? Because if God can lie about that, then he can lie about anything else. If he can lie about the need to put on the fruit of the Spirit and to <coughs> abstain from the works of the flesh, if we cannot be assured that God will do what he says in those regards, if we live that way, then why live that way? Why not live according to the works of the flesh instead of the fruit of the Spirit if God can lie about the situation? God cannot lie in regards to His Word. And so we have to have a respect for it as well. A respect for it that says, I'm not going to try and change and alter it. I'm going to do what He says. Matthew, the, tw the seventh chapter, in verse 21. Jesus would say that not everyone that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. But yet we could say, why do the will of the Father that's in heaven if he can lie about his will? You see it. God cannot lie, and because of that, we can have assurance. And so we don't just cry out, Lord, Lord, as the denominationalists around us, many of them would have us believe. We must do the will of the Father. Now, we could, if we wanted to take the time this, this morning, to look into that doing the will of the Father. What is the will of the Father? Well, it's stated, for example, in Matthew, the 17th chapter, and verse 5, at the Mount of Transfiguration, when he said of his Son, This is my beloved Son, hear ye him. Hear Christ. That's the will of the Father. So we look, go to what Christ said. How do we find what Christ said? Well, he gave that word to his apostles, and they wrote it down for us by inspiration of the Spirit, as well as speaking that word. And so we have that word within the pages of the New Testament now. Now then, he that does the will of the Father, that's the one which will be saved. Not that one that just proclaims, Lord, Lord. That's not the one who's entering into heaven, but the one who obeys the will, who respects the will of the Father. <clears throat> in James 1, in verse 22, James would say, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Many people hear the word, and they think, apparently they think that's all that's necessary. I've heard it. And they've deceived them, their own selves because they don't actively engage in doing that will, that which they have heard. If you skip down a few verses to verse 25, James will add, But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Man that's blessed is a doer of the work. I realize to our denominational friends that's a taboo word almost. But yet, James declares the one who is a doer of the work, that's the one who's going to be blessed. So we look into that law of God. We look into the scriptures and we don't forget what they say. Instead, we took it out we go out and we start applying what it says to our life. 
and we start doing what it says to do, then that's the individual placing their trust in God. Those are the individuals that are going to be blessed. Possibly in this verse, the twice have I heard this, refers to two great truths. The first of those is that God is all-powerful. In Job 42 and verse 2, Job says to God, I know that thou canst do everything and that nothing can be withholden from thee. God is able to do all things, whatsoever he says. What a wonderful power. That power that we see that God has is expressed in three ways. The first of those is in his creative power. This universe... At one time, there was nothing. Nothing existed except God. Those three divine beings. But then they spoke. And through that spoken word, this universe came into existence. Everything that we can see, all of the galaxies the solar systems. All of this world and the things of this world came into existence out of nothingness by the spoken word of God. What power that is. And that that demonstrates. And that he then, upon creating this universe then starts creating those things that would make it habitable for man. And at the end of that creation process on that sixth day, God says, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. And so he created man and then woman for man to be the man's help meet. He was able to create these things out of nothingness, though great power of God. But then second, it's seen in his recreative power. What do we mean by recreate? That's creating in man a new life. The ability to save sinful mankind. Because God had placed man in that garden. There was fellowship that he had with man. But man, because of sin, broke that fellowship and there was that separation. But God is able, because of His great power, to wash away that sin. When we are born, while born innocent and pure, we grow up and we reach that time in which we know to choose the good and to eschew evil, as Isaiah puts it to discern right and wrong, and we commit sin. We separate ourselves from God, and God is able, has the ability to wash that sin away by the blood of Jesus Christ. A recreative power to make us a new man in Christ Jesus, 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17. So that old things are passed away, all things are become new. And then third, through a sustaining power. God is able to sustain us. In Colossians 1, it talks about Christ that by him all things consist, the way the King James puts it. It's the idea that all things are held together by him. That without him, this world would just simply cease to exist. It could not be held together. It could not continue, continue on. It would end. God's power to sustain us and to sustain the Christian We are sustained by the power of God through faith. As Peter describes that we are like a 
someone who has enclosed a fort around us, and as long as we stay within that fort, we have safety. He will sustain us through the trials and tribulations of this world. The attacks that might come, he will be there and he will be protecting us. And as Jesus would say, no man can pluck them out of my hand. Doesn't mean that we cannot leave that palm of safety, but that there's nothing in this world that can snatch us out of, his, out of that hand. And thus, the psalmist says, it's foolish to place trust in man. When all power resides in God, why place trust in weak, frail man? But a second great powerful truth is that God is full of mercy. In a sense, in presenting the power of God to us, the mercy of God sweetens the thought of God's power. That God's power is not going to crush us under its weight, but that He will do those things that are for our good. And so this, uh, Paul would write in 2 Corinthians 1 and verse 3, Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. There's our God who is there who can comfort us because He is the originator. He is the Father of mercies. And that greatest expression of the mercy of God is seen in the death of His Son, that He would be willing to send His Son to this world to die for sinful mankind to deliver man from that bondage of sin that man could not escape on his own. And so Paul would write, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. He recognizes God's grace as that which saves us. We could not save ourselves. In Titus 2, verse 11, he says that the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared unto every man, or to all men. But then he comes down in verse 14 to say, Who gave himself concerning Christ, who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us and from all iniquity, and purify unto himself a peculiar people zealous of good works. Here is God's grace. Where is it seen? It's seen in the gift of, thy, of His Son to come to this world and to die for sinful mankind who gave Himself for us. There's that marvelous grace of God. But that grace of God is found, we see, only in Christ. In St. Timothy 2 and verse 1, Paul would write, Thou therefore my son... Be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. He gives a location where that grace of God is going to be found, that grace that is found in Christ. The only way in which we can get into Christ. Now, in Christ is where the grace is found. How do we get into Christ? It is through that act of baptism as we see in uh, Romans 6 and verse 3 and Galatians 3 and verse 27. We are baptized into Christ where that grace of God is found. Titus 3 and verse 5, Paul would write, Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. You go back, here's the all-powerful God. Power being seen in His ability to create, His ability, His ability to recreate. What? In the fact that He sent His Son to this world to die for sinful mankind. And it, that Son gave Himself for us. And so it's not by works of righteousness that we do 
but it is according to God's grace. When we are obedient, when we get into Jesus Christ, we can then be saved. We can have that recreative ability of God to create in man a new life, and then can, he can sustain us through this life to an eternity with him in heaven. What a great lesson that David presents to us in this psalm. Place your trust in God because that's the only place in which is we can truly have those needs met. The need for salvation, the need for comfort, the need for the troubles and trials that we face within this life to be taken care of, all of them can be placed at the feet of God because He loves us and cares for us and He is one who is worthy of that trust. No wonder the song, He would say, we need to glorify God in our bodies. If you are not a Christian this morning, then obey that gospel of Jesus Christ and allow God to recreate in you a new man by dying to that old man of sin in that act of baptism, being raised to walk in newness of life, that new life that is created in Christ Jesus. If you've become a Christian but you haven't lived in such a way that faithfulness is true of your life, and you realize your need and have that desire this morning to come back to be restored to faithfulness to Him, why not do that this morning as we stand and sing the invitation song?